being here at Google New York. <laughs> and uh, I want to thank Craig for setting us up and also uh, Karina. Um, and I think, so I'm going to talk about a wide range of uh, different intersections between sort of psychology, and brain imaging, and computation. Let, let, let me start out with, with some sort of context and give you sort of, there's an age-old problem, which uh, uh, many of you have heard of, uh, having to do with sort of our disassociation between what the sort of physical aspects of the brain, you know, this three or four pounds of goo in, the, in our head, and sort of our thoughts and feelings and emotions. Sort of, and, and this goes back at least a thousand years, Aristotle and uh, da Vinci and uh, uh, Descartes, for certain, uh, talked about this problem. And, and the question is exactly how do you explain the relationship between these little tiny details, neurons and synapses, and, so and these sort of <laughs> larger integrative structures uh, we think of as systematic behavior. I have a phrase for this, and over the years I've written in a couple different places, I call the neurocognitive gap. It's very simple to explain. Cells fire, you order lunch. And the gap between, you, know, you, you, you sort of, well, some of you are laughing, some of you are going, what is it? No, the, but the gap, but think about it, you know, a few cells fire in your temporal lobe, and all of a sudden you're ordering lunch. Now, this, this should be something that psychologists care about and want to try to explain in some sort of systematic way. That should be really, in my view, the goal of trying to deal uh, with anatomical uh, and functional nature of the brain. Now there's some hope because uh, if you take this particular subject, in fact, much of his behavior could be explained by the anatomy if you look closely enough. Uh, and for uh, poor Homer here, uh, there might be other problems. Um, system level brain measures sort of started only within sort of the last 10 years, uh, maybe the last 15. And um, it began focusing on various kinds of imaging methods. You might be familiar with EEG, you might be familiar with PET, someone who might have had a PET scan, and certainly most people have had some kind of MRI scan. Well, in the 1990s, a new method was invented called functional MRI, which actually allowed you to sort of look at different parts of the brain to see where you might be ordering lunch or thinking about what you're going to have for lunch. And a new field emerged, which I had the pleasure of being involved in, uh, it called cognitive neuroscience. And it was meant to be a blending of cognition, which most neuroscientists really don't care much about because they're measuring single cells, uh, and neuroscience. So to, think, to make cognitive psychologists who don't like to think much about brains uh, start thinking about that kind of paradox in terms of the mind-body problem as it stands in the 21st century. So here we have the promise to look inside the brain and see in real time, or at least sort of real time, cognitive and perceptual processes. And so hopefully this would provide some kind of constraints for our theories, and it would provide some connective tissue back to our understanding of the brain as well. So let's talk a little bit about the brain. The brain's big, okay? The brain's huge in terms of the unit of analysis, and that matters. So the particular way you index it, as you probably all know, matters a lot. And we have something like billions and billions of neurons, and, but in terms of functional regions, we have things that may consist of hundreds of thousands to tens of millions of neurons. The weird part is the average cell has about a thousand connections. So this is sparse, if you think about it. So even though there's a huge number of synapses, relative to this space, the connectivity apparently is very selective for some reason, right? So this is, this is, a, this is a sort of a hint about what's going on. This is a slide I stole from Terry Sanowski some years ago. Uh, and in this slide, he was stressing the idea that there's sort of different ways to approach the brain, different ways to sort of slice and dice it and figure out what level of analysis is the most appropriate level to study. Um, for neuroimagers, and also my, my background actually comes from back in the 80s being involved in a lot of the neural network uh, kind of research and connections research. 
uh, all of this stuff that was happening in neural information processing, NIPs, and a lot of the workshops there are, you know, sort of reflect these different levels of analysis and how they integrate with computation. Uh, what is interesting to me about uh, neuroimaging, or what began to be interesting to me uh, again back in the 90s, was that it, it sort of fell in between maps and net networks. So that's the very famous <laughs> Van Essen map above for uh, visual cortex and extrastriate <laughs> cortex. Uh, and it shows that there's a lot of connectivity, but again, it's relatively sparse. But there's as much feed forward as feed backward. So this is some dynamical system of general interest, which we don't understand. And then there's other sort of smaller circuits that become important uh, to characterize as well. And neuroimaging is a nice place. Now what you're giving up is you're giving up on neurons. But I got, you know, I gotta say that to my neuroscientific friends, uh, or neuroscience friends, uh, that if you really want to study, you know, 50 million neurons or 100 million neurons and try to put a bottom-up story together, this is going to be very tricky to actually uh, uh, sort of define the dynamics underlying that. Yeah. This is kind of a probably ill form question, but no, no but, such thing. but um, so, so I guess we talk about these these different levels and these different chunks of the brain that have that we we sort of talk about as having functions and so on. I presume some of these sort of anatomically you can look at and say, yes, this is a, a real component. I presume there's also other bits that we kind of project some, you know, that we don't know for sure is like an actual organizational part of the brain, but it's for co convenience, or is that not true? Uh, well, actually, I'll go through some of that in a minute when I start talking about the neuroimaging results, which are more sort of system level measures. So what most neuroscientists do is they measure one cell at a time or sometimes 20, and sometimes you know, neuroscience measure 100 cells and they get very excited. And the problem is if you look at the covariant structure of that, that's actually pretty tiny when you're talking about hundreds of millions of neurons. So although we know that there are sort of sensory parts of the brain organized for vision and olfaction and audition and so on, the rest of the cortical structure is not well understood. And the way in which it maps itself out is even more poorly understood. And you'll see that as I go on in this talk. So there is actually, there is a lot of real hierarchy. It's not just for yes. convenience that we're... There's a lot of hierarchy, there's a lot of modularity, but there's also a lot of distributed computation. So the brain has been opportunistic about the way it constructed the underlying, you know, engineering principles, if there are any, to, to make it all work. And that's, that's what makes it very difficult to reverse engineer, I think, too. So I'm going to talk about sort of two kinds of images. One having to do with anatomy, so that's the homer on your left. Uh, and then the functional MRI, which sort of characterize something about these functional states, uh, which you know, Homer doesn't have many, but the, the point is, is you'd like to connect up anatomical structure uh, with functional structure. This is the uh, three test machine at Newark, uh, which is uh, jointly run by uh, our group and uh, group at radiology at umd &J. What you do is basically you put someone <laughs> you know, prone down in one of these machines. Uh, you have a magnet that's spinning very high speed around their head. It's relatively noisy. You have uh, two sort of control computers, one basically to display stimuli in a, a mirror system that then projects uh, into the visual system of the subject. Uh, and then you have uh, a control system to collect the data. And there's probably somewhere between hundreds of megabytes to uh, half a gig per volume per trial. So if you collect 30 or 40 trials or even 100 trials from that subject, you might also have 20 or 30 subjects. So the data uh, collection problem and sort of the storage and manipulation is it's all a nightmare. And this is something we actually had to get used to over many years. Now, fMRI depends on sort of three lucky aspects. It really is a lucky thing. And uh, Seiji Ogawa, who was at Bell Labs, who first noticed this in rats, so they basically opened the top of the rat's head, and they were measuring various things, and they'd see this kind of bluish and very bright reddish response uh, depending on sort of uh, the uh, atmosphere they were feeding to the rat at that time, whether it was oxygen-based or carbon dioxide. 
First off, we're mostly made up of water. So there's a lot of hydrogen protons around in our body that can basically be aligned in a magnetic field. So magnetic susceptibility in tissue ties back to these hydrogen protons. Changes in neural activity produce changes in local blood flow and oxygen consumption. So when you think about lunch, uh, something happens locally in temporal lobe, and then all of a sudden, a bunch of blood flow comes into that region to basically do something metabolic to repair and support the neuron functioning. Now, local blood flow also disrupts local tissue magnetic susceptibility. So when you're thinking about lunch, this actually changes something about the local field. And so that allows for localization in what is relatively a homogeneous field. And so we can pulse and cause some kind of spin change in the protons. And when they relax at different rates, we can localize where it was we thought the task events were occurring. Now, this is called blood oxygenation level dependency, or BOLD. And so that's often what people call the BOLD signal. And it is uh, with fMRI. We have neural activity, uh, blood oxygenation then goes up. And this, in fact, is the basis of the fMRI signal. Now, this is the actual uh, official picture of what's happening in terms of the biophysics. The reality is we have no idea how this happens. So from neural activity into sort of the various kinds of ATP cycles and all the biochemistry, there are models of this. There are theories about it, but we actually, we're, the science that we're doing is sort of based on this uh, slippery business that neural activity has something to do with blood flow. Now that doesn't bother me very much because I'm not a neuroscientist and this as a psychologist is just another kind of systematic measure I can use uh, to understand behavior. What comes out the output we call a 2T star weighted image intensity and this is essentially the fMRI signal basically being measured by the magnet and being uh, pulled back out and uh, we then can analyze it and localize it more specifically. So the hemodynamic response is the first sort of uh, problem in this story because we're talking about blood flow. So it's relatively slow. Now there's ways of dealing with this I'll talk about later on in, in, in ways you might want to fuse some fast signal like EEG with fMRI. But in general, what we've got essentially something that lasts over 18 seconds. Uh, the task information or the peak is somewhere around 68 seconds, maybe four seconds. So the largest point where we might like to sort of uh, uh, phase shift this back to the task stimulus. So if the stimulus occurs here, we might like to push this back here so that we actually have most of the signal sitting right on the stimulus onset. And so that's a lot what people do now. We found out much later we didn't have to do that, but that's, that was the state of the art back at that time period. Here's standard sort of experimental methods. Uh, one is the classic block design where we have some kind of stimulus event in a, a set of trials in a block, and then we have a rest period. These can be, as, again, as long, buffered as long as about 10 seconds apart because we basically want the decay to decay, de decay back down to zero, and then we hit uh, uh, the, uh, the subject with another stimulus, and up it goes, and, and so on and so forth. So if we have a kernel function that's a hemodynamic response that looks like this, uh, this bidonic thing, then in fact, if we convolve that with the design, we basically get something like this, and we actually see this kind of patterning in the bolt during the task. We can also do an event <laughs> related where in fact we jitter the stimulus a little bit or, or the particular trial, and this produces a complex waveform, but as long as we know where the actual stimulation were, we can go back and use various statistical models to pull that out. So we do that like this. We have an fMRI time series up here in the left-hand corner. Now, one of the things that people do while they're laying down for more than 15 minutes in a, in a magnet is they wiggle. So you have to do some kind of motion correction. Uh, we do some kind of spatial normalization to a reference. So the standard reference is the Talarak and Turneau reference based uh, on some work done in the 1870s. Uh, in Paris on a small French man's brain. But it's, it's digitized and it's very accessible. There's other anatomical references that are available, 
but this is still one of the better ones. So we actually do you know, some kind of warping to get it into this atlas space so that we can then reference specific points in the brain uh, back in the telerac turno reference. Uh, we do some smoothing to clean things up because there's a lot of noise. We fit it with a general linear model, which then produce some parameter estimates. And you can see here's a block design with some data. And you can sort of see it goes up and down. And the blue curve is our best estimate from the GLM. So it's not terrible. Uh, and then we can project this back into a map. We have a statistical parametric map. And that produces that we can then color code based on the underlying statistics. We calculated the T values or F values. And we get some pretty pictures. So that's, if you looked at any journals or science or nature, you'd find essentially pictures like this. And this is how they make them. So in a classic design, here's a glass brain, and here's finger tapping. So a finger tapping test, I'd be laying the magnet, I'd be doing this, flopping my fingers tediously for a while, and then I'd stop, and I'd do it again, and I'd stop, and so on. You do that in four or five blocks, you start getting things in terms of central sulcus and the motor strip, which represents where you expect to see things if you're tapping your fingers together. Uh, and you can see there's the block design in terms of the contrast. We're basically then contrasting the signal condition against the background rest condition. Because the, the bolt signal in this is actually not more than 3 or to 5%. Okay, So it's extremely hard to see in all this noise. And there's an enormous amount of noise that you actually have to filter out. So how did people localize functions before this? <laughs> we knew about chunks of the brain? Uh, basically, uh, in uh, risky uh, operations <laughs> that were mainly done at McGill uh, uh, back in the 40s and 50s, where you would look at epilepsy, you'd have, some, you'd have some motivation for opening the skull up and then poking around. Okay? The other thing are animal models in terms of the macaque monkey, which is sort of the most common subject where, again, you can do single cell recording and you can put visual stimuli up and see, you know, oh, that part of the brain seems to do this, or have the monkey do this with its arm, and you can sort of measure and see cells fire uh, in various parts of the motor system, and also an extra stripe. And so you can make connections between visual system and motor system, attentional systems, which is parietal areas, prefrontal systems, so when you're cooking Chinese food or Thai food or whatever, your dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex is gonna be involved because it's gotta sequence things. When you're writing a computer program, if I put you an MRI, I will see dorsal lateral pre, I'll see middle frontal gyrus going bang, 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 because there's just an enormous amount of sort of sequencing structure that's going on there, as well as spatial imagery and other kinds of things. So we know a lot about that from, you know, hundreds or perhaps thousands of experiments that were done, especially with monkeys uh, and then also in, in humans, but typically in operations. It wasn't until the 90s where we could actually look at this stuff. Now, I got to tell you, it really annoyed a lot of the neuroscientists because People would do this, and they'd say, oh, you know, I put stuff in, in the visual field. And th you know, the visual cortex got active. And neuroscientists said, yeah, so what? <laughs> like, big deal. We already knew the visual cortex. So, so at that point, there had to be some uh, more information coming out of this. Because uh, you know, one of these machines costs $4 million. You, you, you're, you're doing horrible things. Uh, well, not really in terms of fMRI sound. But in PET, it's horrible. You've got to inject people with contrast agents. So that there's, there's got to be something other than what we're getting out in terms of monkeys. And it turns out there, there is, and, and I'll, I'll show you some of that. But so this is sort of the traditional state of the art uh, uh, at this point, and I'm going to move then into some newer methods, especially methods using machine learning and neural networks and so on, uh, and some sort of graphical uh, connectivity theory uh, that's applied to brain areas as people are doing sort of uh, online tasks. Any questions so far? So this should this should allow you to, to basically go off and run a neuroimaging experiment, really. Yes? Is there any risk to the subjects? No, in fact, in this case, fMRI uh, has been tested even up near uh, five or six T with humans, and you've, you've seen no problems. You, and typically, you do nine Tesla experiments with rodents and so on. And, there are really any, any problems. There can be problems with the magnet. Uh, if you don't set the parameters up right, it can seize and 
basically blow up and th this is not good. If you uh, have metal chairs in the room with you and you turn the magnet on, this whole row will move really rapidly right through the middle of the magnet and run out the other side. So many times, subjects these days will have metals in their ears and everywhere, and so we basically have to you know, sort of demagnetize uh, them in, in order to get them into the magnet. Um, uh, and then there's artifacts that can occur as well, if you're not careful, uh, which, is, which, is, which is more important in terms of the science, at least. Yeah? Not good. So we're talking about, uh, in fact, let me go through that. I've got, I've got some slides on that. So here's MRI and here's fMRI. So in terms of fMRI, nice segue, we have a three millimeter resolution, but it can actually be better. We can get it down to one millimeter. And these are, are, are voxels, so three dimensional sort of image elements. Uh, MRI actually can get down to a half millimeter. And so this is showing sort of, you know, if you had a brain tumor and you went to the doctor, they would basically give you an MRI and look at it and try to see what was, uh, where it might be and what they could do about it. The fuzzy picture, the, the uh, fMRI, in fact, we collect over time, let's say in trial bites of two seconds for like five minutes or up to an hour. Um, and we get one of these images, uh, but for the whole brain. So basically, we're taking your whole brain, firing it uh, through, dropping it on the disk, and saving it every two seconds. Bang, 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 bang. And so you get a lot of data this way. Now, here's uh, uh, the slice terminology. This is a sagittal slice, and that we're cutting essentially down the sagittal side of the head. And we're going to take something like 10 slices, and these will produce slices from the top of the head down to the bottom. And it basically then gives you all of the sort of voxel information and the gray and white and cerebral spinal fluid information uh, that's in the image. Uh, an in-plane slice will then be cut into voxels, which in this case is 64 by 64. We often, it probably goes up to 128 by 128 uh, for the anatomicals. For most of the bold data, uh, it's 64 by 64. A kind of experiment, here we have the stimulation control. So in terms of what I was talking about, in terms of the GLM, uh, what, you're, what you get here is then some stimulation. You can see there's not a whole lot of difference when you look at it visually. But when you subtract it, all of a sudden you start picking up stuff in V1, in precuneus maybe. And you can see across individuals uh, there is some similarity, but there's also differences. And averaging can always be useful in this situation. Although there's a lot of worry today that we're missing some of the individual difference information here, and we, we have to be a little more careful about what kind of generalizations you draw from this. The kinds of activation statistic studies, here you would have, say, condition one, which could consist of maybe uh, 30 or so stimulations, condition two. Again, then we might create a region of interest, a specific point that we want to look for activation in, and then we plot that, and we see the IRO time course in the red condition is a little higher than in the green condition. And then you can uh, you know, sort of throw away all the multivariate information and put it into a bar graph. And then plotting it back in the brain, we essentially see, yeah, there's activation here. And it seems to be modulated by these two conditions in that specific way. So that's kind of a classic study to look at the different kinds of modulation effects uh, in, in your uh, experiment. OK, so let me switch over and talk a little bit about uh, newer stuff. But that gives you, I think, the fundamentals for if you went to a science article, you'd actually read it, and you could probably make sense of it in terms of what's actually been done. And you might not like it in terms of what exactly they're concluding, because there has been a kind of a focus on sort of one area, one function, sort of finding the face area, finding the morality area, et cetera. And that's probably just false. And I'm going to show you, in fact, uh, one of the things, controversies I'm on one side of happens to be you know, whether or not there is a face area. And I basically say there isn't. And then there's a, a Nancy Canwisher and other people who say, in fact, there's absolutely a face area. So let's talk about that. And you probably all think you do have a face area. I mean, it makes sense 
faces have this kind of sociobiological relevance. You look at them. There should be something in the brain that gets active. Uh, the question is, is there a specific area? And does it you know, sort of act like a simple module, sort of on off based on seeing uh, a face? So here's some stimuli that get used in these kinds of experiments. We have faces and houses and scissors and sort of various uh, natural objects and categories. And what we might do is then, in this kind of block design, is give the subject some faces in the block, measure their activity, give them rest time, then give them some scissors, and so on and so forth. And these would be in different orientations, different sizes, different kinds, and so on and so forth. And uh, we counterbalance this and randomize it so the subject doesn't actually know what's coming up. Now, when you do this, in the past, there's about a thousand studies by now showing, in fact, if you take this is the back of the brain, and so we're kind of looking up underneath it, and we've got the two hemispheres, and I've taken one of the hemispheres and I've turned it up like this on its side. So that's that point where it's, and underneath there, more medial, uh, towards the, the middle of the brain, is the parahippocampal place area, as it's called, but uh, out towards the side of the head, sort of back through here, is called the fusiform face area, or the FFA. And this area is supposed to respond almost exclusively to faces and nothing else. Now, it does respond to headless bodies. It responds to upside-down heads. Uh, but in general, if you look at chairs and uh, houses and coffee cups and so on, it responds about three times less on, uh, uh, in, in, in most tests uh, than it does to upright faces uh, uh, in some sort of angle. And so that FFA area is very controversial, but uh, Kanwisher has made uh, a strong case that there is such a place. Now, in 2001, there was some work done by Jim Haxby uh, who looked at this in a, in a slightly more complicated way. He wanted to understand if there's sort of patterns of activity that might characterize this as opposed to specific local modular areas. So he had a, a what's called an in-back test. It's just a category of vigilance test. So you get a stream of stimuli, and you basically have to say, is the one that I'm looking at now the same as the one I looked at two steps before, or three, or whatever? Now, if you do this, again, in a block design, you get this kind of uh, result. Now, this is at the bottom of the brain. So this is a slice that's right about here, right in your, the middle of your ears, coming straight back. And it's showing in even runs and odd runs in the block that if you show a face, that top uh, picture there, uh, it essentially, if you look at the patterns, can you see, in fact, the patterns in the even runs in terms of the averaging? This is like a, a one nearest neighbor classifier, if you will, the way he did it. Uh, you would you basically have the very similar patterns, but across faces the houses, in fact, the patterns, there's more of the yellow uh, on the right-hand side, less of the blue, and so on and so forth. Same thing with chairs and shoes. So there seem to be sort of positive correlations across even odd runs for the same stimulus, but either no correlation or small negative correlations across these stimuli. And if you looked at a bar graph, you'd see, in fact, that uh, the stimulus associated with even and odd run was, in fact, the best predictor of that particular condition. And even when you removed uh, uh, he removed the maximally responsive voxels, not just the ones that Nancy Canwisher would say were like in the middle of the fusiform area, which is a particular area in the fusiform gyrus, which runs around the back of the head. Uh, he removed those, and still the orange was still a response. So whatever's going on there was relatively distributed and uh, led people to start questioning the idea whether or not we could actually understand these brain functions in this sort of one to one anatomical functional map. We did some work with some simple neural networks where we took something like 1,500 voxels and some number of hidden units, did some conjugate gradient and sort of fit this thing, uh, did uh, N minus one bootstrap sampling on it. So that sort of introduced new technology uh, where people were doing these sort of simple linear models and they really weren't doing cross-validation. They really had no idea what in fact they had. When you do this, you actually get a fairly good prediction scheme so this is about something like 82% uh, over the whole set. Bottle and scissors are sort of the worst case, but if you look back at the original Haxby stimuli, they were sort of 
little tiny scissors and the bottles were all kind of fuzzy. So it's not surprising that in fact you didn't get sort of the kind of visual response that you expected. Uh, the in-sample classification was 100% correct, of course. Now what we can do is actually query the classifier and basically do a perturbation test and ask which particular voxels, which particular features in the input layer were contribute to different classes. So what we would do is just run noise back through the network, and whenever we saw a particular error that was above some threshold, we plot it. If it wasn't above that threshold, we threw the voxel away. So what this gave us was a sensitivity map in the classifier space that could then tell us, well, is there a specific category mapping for face, house, scissors, shoe that's distinct across IT? Well, it's about 85% overlapping. So in fact, this suggested it was more of a combinatory code, sort of like playing a piano chord, okay? And then modulating that, and you get face, 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 or house, 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 or scissors, so that the category sort of information was coded in some unknown feature way, but still coded as some features. So there's this, this pathology of not being able to see or recognize faces. It's claimed to be- Prosopagnosia. Know, right. That, right. I mean, that, that doesn't that- I'm That would seem, that yeah, there's all kinds of problems with those kinds of studies. And actually there's a review of them to show that some prosopagnosis do see faces, some don't. It's kind of, but if you look, the, the key thing here is if you look in IT and you look at the lesion space, the lesion space covers most of those dots. In other words, you know, the kind of problem that you would have if you weren't a developmental prosopagnosic, but you had some kind of damage in temporal lobe, that actually the, those lesions are opportunistic. They're all over the temporal lobe. So that doesn't really prove that there's some specific location. And these people have other kinds of deficits too, really, if you start looking more carefully. Yeah, it's not just faces. Yeah. No. Disable that part of the brain? No. Actually, I was on the very early NIH TMS uh, options panel, and the, uh, the uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation basically is, is essentially a method uh, where you send a magnetic pulse uh, into the brain and you sort of desynchronize neurons. In some sense, the idea is you're deactivating. But in fact, the reality is you're sending a cone uh, of sort of magnetic stimulation. It's all over the brain. And if you look at these people, when they, if you've ever seen such stuff, they basically just bang. It was, which led me to ask the question at the end of this, well, would your research be any different if you just took a baseball bat and hit them on the head in the same place? And I didn't get a good answer from that. So uh, TMS is not uh, really going to work here. There's people like Coslin and others who claim it does, but it's sort of dying. Uh, this work also, Louise Posoa has done some SVM, uh, support vector machine work with this. And here's a really cute example where you're at 60 milliseconds. So you're showing blank, you know, uh, fixation, fixation, and then 60 milliseconds, a fearful face, and then a neutral face. And all, and then this is alternating with neutral, neutral, and fear face, and they're coming randomly. Well, it turns out if you take a classifier, you can actually look at the fMRI activity alone over uh, a number of regions of interest. And the more you have, the better you do. And you get a very sharp uh, hit curve having to do with the probably reporting fear. But the interesting thing about this is you can predict before they say or push the button that they saw the fear face just from looking at the temporal lobe. So you can actually see the part of the brain that's coding for this before they respond. So you can just read that out. And, it's, it's, it, and this is 60 milliseconds. So given what I said earlier, you should go, what? Well, there's something wrong here, because you said it was like six seconds. Right. And in fact, the temporal resolution of fMRI is a little tricky. We don't actually understand what the temporal resolution is either. Uh, and that's caused a number of us to try to do uh, tasks to combine various kinds of fast measures like EEG with fMRI, which I'll talk about next. So am I still good? Yeah. Okay. So uh, brain interactivity, we're going to look at interacting brain states. And arguably, if you think of any cognitive function, if you're multiplying two numbers together, if you're writing a C++ program, whatever it is, it, there's a bunch of uh, areas of the brain that are interacting. And what we'd like to understand is that network, is that sort of circuit structure. 
not just one particular area of the brain with some function. In fact, it might be that these areas of the brain sort of get reused in different kinds of functions where you're doing different things. This is one of the early uh, pieces of work. Actually, it was done in 2004, so this is very recent stuff. And this was in science. It was by Yuri Hussan and Rafi Malik at the Weizmann Institute. Uri's a postdoc at NYU right now. Uh, and what you do is, here they gave the two subjects the movie to watch. So this was the good, the bad, and the ugly. And they watched it for 30 minutes. And then they simply recorded all of the fMRI while they were watching this movie together. Uh, and then took the time series from each voxel. So roughly in gray matter in a, a flattened cortical map, we have something like 20,000 voxels. So you're taking 20,000 time series and point by point correlating between the two subjects while they're watching the same film. What do you get? Well, something that was really shocking in the beginning. But now when you think about it, it's not too shocking. Now what this is, by the way, this is what we call the football brain. So you've taken the brain and you've uh, kind of inflated it in certain parts, and then you cut down central sulcus and a couple other places and you flatten it. So the back of the head and visual cortex is right back here. Temporal cortex, which I was showing you a minute ago, is up here. Prefrontal, the front of the head's up here. Well, what you found is this there high correlation in visual areas and in areas that seem to have to do with motion detection, the STS, uh, object recognition in terms of faces and hands and other objects that were very active. And then there was all this dead man's land. All this stuff that didn't seem to be correlated with anything that seems to have some kind of intermediate processing structure going on here. So this is really an anatomical statement that visual areas are highly connected and highly correlated and they connect out to various prefrontal areas and various parietal areas. And so there is some kind of circuit here that even across two subjects, you can sort of see it emerge in the anatomical uh, uh, underlying structure. So we want to take advantage of this. And so we're going to, we're, we started to look at movies as well. Here we have, in fact, what we call uh, sort of event comprehension studies. And here we, in this case, we take a scripted video that we construct. Let me show you an example of one. Uh, And in this case, what you'll see is someone sitting in a restaurant, uh, and they're reading the paper, and it looks like they're basically doing the same thing. And at some point, we ask people to press a button when they think there's event change. That's basically it. That's all we add to this. And when the waitress appears, she puts the paper away, people think this is an event change. And you can think of this in terms of a parsing of the video into different video elements at change points that people think are relevant to coding or comprehending that video structure. Uh, now we have a number of these. So I'm going to show you them all, but I'll show you some. Here's a typical case. Is a, the, one of my graduate students putting together a chair that was delivered in a package. Uh, a, a postdoc that was who made coffee every day, and we filmed him making coffee. But these were fixed sequences, so. Donovan is his name. Was, you know, we, we would yell off lines and say, okay, pick up the coffee pot one second. And then we would time all this. And this would give us sort of an exact sense of where, in fact, subjects were breaking this information up. And you get sort of reliable kinds of results. Another kind of example is we call the house sequence. And here you basically have a circle that begins randomly moving through this space. That's all it's doing. But it basically people look at this and, and people hate to look at things and not have stories about them. So they make up stories. They say, well, the ball's looking for something. Like now, if you put a triangle in there and have the triangle move around with the ball moving around, they'll say, oh, the ball's chasing the triangle. You know, they're, they're some sexual harassment thing, something. They'll make up something specifically about this story here. And then we have an oddball task where we simply have a bar that jitters up and down. And at some point, it will jitter about three standard deviations. Uh, beyond what is normally jittering. So there's a small standard deviational jitter. And the, and the subject simply to push the button at that jitter point. Unbeknownst to them, we've arranged these jitter points to be at the same point they were pressing the button in another video sequence. So we control for the button pressing. We control for the perceptual bottom-up uh, kind of analysis that they're doing. What you find is something quite remarkable when people do this. It basically we call these temporal response densities. 
they're essentially probability distributions over time showing so for a particular tape this is the study tape where a student comes in opens a book and studies for a while uh, you see there's at 0.01 probability in this distribution here's about one two three four five six seven and these are essentially 20 or 25 subjects that are pressing the button and we simply accumulate that frequency at that particular time second to indicate where in fact that point was you can go back and show subjects these out of say 20 films they've seen and if they see that particular index point or that particular change point, that's the most memorable or memory carrying part of the sequence. Same thing in the house tape. Uh, there's a bit more, maybe 10 or 12 of these. Now what we found though, which is sort of annoying, is there's uh, people who parse things very fast and people who parse things very slow. And this can cause a lot of, this cause a lot of trouble if you, if you marry and then you take a road trip together and you sort of miss the corner. And so the, 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 the fact is, is that the difference in this differential parsing will in fact produce different memory encoding too of what you remember about that particular sequence. So when you look at that in terms of the data, you see in fact there's a huge rate difference from people who are pushing the button at a very slow rate. They, okay, they, 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 they're, they're paying, they're paying uh, for a ticket at a movie theater. He takes out his wallet, picks up the ticket, leaves. Someone else says, he moves his hand towards his wallet. He moves his hand, wallet out of his pocket. He lifts and opens up his wallet. He moves some money out of it. And then he puts the money, he picks up the ticket, he looks at the ticket, he puts the ticket. And so they're, they're picking out all this detail. That's these people up here. So they'll have something like somewhere between 40 to 80 events in these sequences uh, instead of, say, four or five. Now, here's the interesting thing. If you take the two videos or any set of videos and you simply take that person's parsing rate and you plot it against their parsing rate on the other video, it's about 0.86 correlated. What happens is we all have these natural parsing rates and we maintain them in order to sort of construct whatever memory sequence is sort of most compatible with the information we've already collected. This is expectation driven. Okay, as opposed to, say, that oddball task. Okay. So let's talk about how we can model this in terms of brain activity. We essentially have a lot of cognition that trots itself out, uh, perception, memory, sequence, grammar, and so on. But we're going to be interested in some kind of interactive distributed process that is time dynamic, that's structured, and we know that has some kind of neural network circuit. In this case, what we're going to try to do is we're going to connect together EEG and fMRI for real-time measure. EEG measures, you may not know, are not spatially very good. They're spatially ill-posed, so you don't get a unique solution when you try to find the location. But they're extremely fast. They're like millisecond level, so you can see events at each millisecond. Uh, fMRI is an order of seconds, as I said, but you get down to a millimeter, even though this may be a million neurons, it's still uh, relatively small. So what we did is we, during that restaurant task, we measured uh, EEG and fMRI together. And this, in fact, is a sequence of fMRI and EEG activities. Uh, you don't really have to see the details here. But what's happening is that we're seeing a coordination between frontal uh, and uh, visual cortical activity and in the EEG, we see a huge sort of negative uh, deflection over the whole brain as the event change occurs. So we began to think about this once we looked at a couple hundreds of these sequences, that we could possibly fuse these two together and use the resultant information to create some kind of dynamic model. So that's what we did. This is uh, a fusion model that uh, my graduate student, Yarik Halchenko, basically came up. We're doing, we're doing forward modeling of the EEG and the fMRI. The simple uh, story here is that since EEG doesn't have much spatial information, we actually construct a spatial filter for it. Since fMRI doesn't have much temporal information, we use the hemodynamic response for temporal information, and then we couple the equations together and then generate a cost function 
and solve this using a gradient method, and we uh, regularize it. And we're basically reconstructing the signals. We, we wrote a, a book chapter on this that actually reviewed all these fusion methods. I can uh, give you that uh, later if you're interested in the details. Here's what it looks like when you fuse the material together. So now we're looking at two seconds before the event change. You'll see the event change right there. So now, unlike the fMRI and EEG, this is actually spatially accurate information within a millimeter occurring over milliseconds. And so this actually gives you a chance to model something about the underlying time series in a way to create some kind of dynamical uh, graph. You could think of Bayesian networks or you know, whatever your favorite structural equation modeling and so on. What we do is this. These get a little dense, I apologize. but. Uh, what we're going to do then, however you localize this activity, we're generating brain activity at different points. We pull out the time series information. We do filtering and reconstruction. So now every ROI basically has a time series associated with it. We construct a covariance measure uh, of all of the time series down here, and then we actually calculate all the possible graphs there are three raised to the n times n minus 1 over two of them. So it gets very large. For five nodes, you have 60,000 graphs. For seven, it goes up to 14 million or something. So this rise is very fast. We then score these graphs, and we keep the top 1% uh, in a goodness of fit measure, like Akiyiki, and then we construct a graph. And so for the films I was just showing, we did that for all the graphs. And here's what they look like. Here's the oddball task, which actually has a cingulate, which is known for sort of novelty detection, uh, STG or STS, which is a motion detection, IPL, uh, inferior parietal lobule, which is associated with spatial imagery uh, and spatial functioning, and medial frontal gyrus, which is an executive control function. When you look at this with the ambiguous story where you have the little ball moving around in the room and so on, again, you still get cingulate, you, st you get a little bit more we're now getting medial frontal gyrus, or Broca's area, which is also noted for sequential kinds of analysis. And finally, in the familiar story, we get all of the same areas, but you can see there's a reordering of the underlying structure. So I don't have time to go into all the detail, but if you look here, cingulate, as you go to the familiar story, disappears. Why? Because cingulate is actually used for novelty detection. So if you really don't know what's going on, cingulate is basically going to drive a lot of Aha, oh, what's, what's that? Oh, I got to follow that, track this, and so on. But you'll notice that it disappears down here in the familiar story, and sequence response selection begins to appear in the ambiguous story and moves to the familiar story. Again, very important for sort of structuring and understanding the story elements and putting them together uh, in a comprehensible form. So, in summary, what I've been trying to tell you today uh, is uh, sort of about how brain imaging is evolving and that really these hypotheses should be more about these underlying networks and not specific regions of interest or areas. There's, we think, like a software reusability concept in that these areas, STS or medial frontal gyrus and so on, are basically being recruited for that task at that time. And as a new task comes up, they don't disappear, they simply sort of automatically rewire and produce some other function that's opportunistic for that particular uh, task the subject is doing. And in effect, uh, we think the dynamics of cognition can be found, the dynamics of the brain, the mind is the brain, uh, unlike uh, Descartes. So let me just mention some of the people who are involved in this in some of our project. Uh, J.B. Pauline, who's actually at the Orsay Lab uh, in France. Uh, we're doing uh, with Barack Perlmutter, who's a machine learning a guy who did some of the first independent components analysis. He's at the Hamilton Institute in Dublin. Uh, Catherine Hansen, who did a lot of the event perception work, the phase perception work uh, with Jim Haxley. We have a paper coming out in NeuroComp uh, in a month that basically shows using support vector methods and recursive feature elimination that there you know, really isn't a face area. And uh, we also have a large 
uh, autism center where we're actually looking at using these various methods to actually understand something about special populations where in fact you have various kinds of attentional deficits but in more complicated sort of wiring issues uh, in terms of autism and schizophrenia for example. And that's it and thanks for your attention and uh, happy to take any more questions or, or thoughts, so thanks. Yeah. I just hadn't thought about applying these sorts of methods to uh, simpler brains. Uh, to uh, uh, primate or crustaceans. crustaceans. Uh, the, 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 the problem, you know, well, one of the interesting things there that strikes one when uh, we're thinking about these brain circuits, it's the same thing that people were thinking about 10 years ago when we were finding areas of the brain, was that you could do some kind of uh, sort of genetic mapping to brain function. And this is important, especially in terms of you know, disease kinds of analysis and sort of connecting a particular part of the genetic code back up to uh, what it is that's actually under the root of autism. Is autism one thing or is it a hundred things? And so what sort of genetic connections are. Um, knockout mice and brain imaging kind of activity are, are used in these contexts. But uh, my interests are mainly in sort of cognitive function, and although mice are smart, they, they don't have a lot of cognitive function. Um, and the kinds of uh, measurements one can make there are still relatively uh, limited in terms of the kind of task, class conditioning, and other sort of simple associative learning tasks. Um, and so I, and so, you know, maybe very uh, early on, but we're scaling up two human kinds of phenomena. And the thing is, is the areas of the brain that I'm showing you, they're very familiar. They, they, they come out almost on any kind of task. It's almost like some kind of uh, infrastructure that's sitting there, and they organize in various ways, uh, in different ways, when the subject is doing working memory tasks or problem-solving tasks or uh, learning a language, et cetera. But they're the same areas. And so we know that we've got some kind of constituent structure you know, some functions that we can actually put together in some way that might make some larger sense. So that, that there, that I think there is a large amount of progress here um, and I, where it should start first bearing fruit is in a lot of the disease uh, kinds of contexts which are sort of the most devastating things that we're, you know, are just very curious. Sure. For, for genetics or brain? Uh, for brain, like related areas of brain. Uh, well, uh, there's, there's older work that has to do with uh, what was called split brain studies, where in fact you've had some sort of epileptic seizure kinds of, kind. and one of the things about the epileptic seizure is that it works off of some sympathetic dynamics. So some activity starts over here, and there's some bilateral activity, and then they begin to produce some saturation and wapo, everything uh, tips. Well, what they found is they could take the brain is uh, lateralized and symmetrically, so you can basically take um, at the corpus callosum and you can cut a small fibrous channel. Now, this doesn't sound like something you want to do in general, but if you do do it, it actually stops an epileptic seizure. Um, and because the, the seizure structure can be somewhat random, and it's geometry, it's very hard to do this without, so it, but it does get lateralized and that's the part that produces like 95% of the seizures. So for someone who wants a cure, that was something they did back in the 70s and still do. Uh, it produces some funny kinds of perceptual phenomena in the subject and they often get a sense that their left side of their body is doing things they have no control over, like taking their tie off and putting it on the table or something put it back on and it takes it back on, things like it. So there's these kind of very weird sort of functional separations. Uh, but uh, most kinds of seizure stuff is, uh, the dynamics of that is, is, is very, very tricky and, and uh, not, not under control. You could do some kind of 
the transcranial brain stimulation in this case could probably help, but uh, mainly because it would produce a kind of a, uh, a disruption of, of the basic activity. But, you know, the, the synchronization would be wiped out. Implants is another way of doing it. That's another way of sort of creating some kind of disruption. But again, it, that would be less effective because you'd actually have to predict where these implants would be. And unless you'd use constant monitoring, uh, it's also very risky. You're doing. You don't want to really have uh, some sort of electrical stimulation that automatically takes off whenever it feels like it. So that would be a bad thing. Which might actually cause seizures. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Behavior and behavior. Right. Then you see that you get the idea of the Yes, 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 yes. I, 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 I think very imaging work right now is, is really some kind of renaissance. And this is why I bring up a lot of this stuff. Uh, I run a workshop at the Middle Year Mitz uh, meeting. Uh, so uh, I run a workshop there for like, like the last five years or so. Where I try to bring together various kinds of machine learning and neural network people and have brain imaging people to create more of this connectivity. Because there's a, a lot of dynamics in there. You can just take, like uh, Hassan did, and take just box of time series books. By the way, do nothing else to correlate, you generate all these interesting correlations. This is just a gold mine for really doing interesting kinds of modeling work. Which, you know, I just, I probably talked about 85% of it right now. So there's a, there's a growth of an industry here. In five years, some of us will get 20 dollars a year. But a lot of it will, in fact, I think, in the end of the year. Especially in terms of the graphical modeling. Graphical modeling is, it, it, it's going to be very important within four or five years that people start talking graphs or circuits than areas. They should be talking about the frontal, uh, pole, parietal, you know, Circuit, which we know has to do with attention systems. That will be a, a, a real predictor of the way of thinking about it. And that's often where science uh, makes a difference because it changes the way of thinking. Yeah? I think like the types of graphical models you're describing run the risk of following the same trap that people did when they went to boxes and arrow diagrams, which is that they sort of propose a sparsity that doesn't actually exist. You're absolutely right, and, and, and I take this as a, sort of a first order kind of thing. I'm more interested in sort of dynamical systems that actually model this and learn over time. We, we, I got a project with a, a statistician, Maria Clark Greenwood, who had written some of the very first work on Bayesian networks. And one of the issues is how do you sort of control the asymptotics? So you're, you're exactly right. This stuff. The our peers, in fact, we're seeing so many unprincipled uses of this. It's sort of like, if you, you know, if you have a muddle looking at areas, what happens if you have a, you know, a whole bunch of areas and the common choice of that just drives people off you know, the deep end? So there has to be some principles in which you want to do this modeling. And you better get the asymptotic straight before you start going off into the sort of puppy and the dynamics and the sort of crazy causality and all kinds of stuff. That actually, you know, that's the but, but that's okay. It's still it's still early, and there's still um, a lot of good people out there that get it, and I uh, think there will be progress in this stuff. But your, your, our models are really just snapshots, and we we want to think of these as little data structures that you could you know sort of show to people and say, okay, this is a data structure that has this property, and this property, and that one, and what did you get in your study, and so. This allows us to, uh, I think, share the information at a more relevant level of investigation. But it is a worry. So, if you were to assume that the computer scientists can deal with the computation side of things, how long would you estimate it will take a cognitive neuroscience <laughs> to get a, sort of, you know, an accurate enough model of the brain that, that we can? Well, the good news the good news is the the brain imaging data is being accumulated online and will in fact be available to you know almost anyone in the public domain, especially uh, people who have computational savvy. 
If you look at human brain mapping as a conference, which its structure really started out as more methodological biophysicists and mathematicians and kind of computer scientists, and then expanded out to cognitive neuroscience, now it's sort of overrun with a lot of people who are admittedly doing silly things, you know, let's look at people gambling. And so, you know, it's so, so essentially, if you, there's almost any question you can ask about something that you have an image device, and, and you'll get back nonsense. I mean, I once decided to do a study to try to counter this. I called it the peanut butter and jelly study. Uh, in fact, we did part of this where you took pictures of peanut butter sandwiches, and then you took pictures of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, but different ones, like Norman Rockwell drawing different kind of black and white images. And then you get the two contrast conditions to subtract them. Clearly, you're going to get the jelly here. And in fact, I know where that is. It's in temporal mode. But this is absurd. I mean, in fact, there's something about the level of reference here that's just wrong. And you need to get that uh, clear uh, at some constituent level, like in terms of these brain areas and the way they organize to solve certain fundamental tasks. The fundamental tasks we, we chose here were had to do with sort of these natural image sequence uh, parsing because this is what we do every day. It's it's sort of it's sort of more ecologically valid. It has some sort of more natural context for it. Uh, did that answer your question? I think it kinda beyond the foreseeable future. It's just it maybe it may be in two hundred years time, maybe not. Well um, I you know, yes, progress is slow here, but the, the, these devices have actually only been effectively used probably in the past eight years. And so, I mean, relatively speaking, we, have, we, we, do, we do have a little more leash uh, on the whole system. But I, I, I do think the methods are, you know, uh, can, can give you sort of remarkable data about certain kinds of processes that you couldn't imagine. Thank you.